What's up, everyone? Welcome back. It's another episode of Masari's Unqualified Opinions. I'm Ryan Selkis at 2 Bit Idiot. Haven't caught up with my friend Mason Borda in a while. He is the co founder and CEO of Tokensoft. He was actually one of the original guinea pigs for Unqualified Opinions back <laughs> when we were doing it on this little spindly iPhone stand that we were balancing up against a whiteboard in our WeWork. And it was literally just the most bootstrapped uh, <laughs> during your varsity. Uh, test uh, case for, for for this podcast, but it ended up being a very very fun conversation, and um, and at it least was now it was a good setup. You can tell. side by side, yeah. <laughs> um, wearing uh, wearing the swag, uh, of course. Do you do you want to explain why your hat is is such a perfect brand uh, piece of collateral for TokenSoft because of how it subtly hints at so many of the problems that you guys are solving. <laughs> yeah, so uh, at TokenSoft, uh, we started out to uh, help companies issue security tokens, whether they're enterprises, uh, they are asset managers, or they're financial institutions and banks. Um, and so uh, if you're going to invest in uh, securities offerings in the US, and let's say they're, they're private offerings, they're not like IPOs, um, you need to be uh, what is called a, a credit investor, and so one of the primary things that our website does is it checks for uh, investors and makes sure that they're accredited before coming into the website. And so uh, we, we thought, you know, um, you know it's, it's a lot of work to uh, become a credit investor. You have to have certain, uh, certain net worth um, and uh, you have to uh, go through all these hoops to have a lawyer review your bank information. So uh, why don't we just give everyone the experience of being an accredited investor? And so that's why we made these hats. Uh, this has a credit investor on it. So now everyone can, uh, can have the experience. And, and all you need to do is take a selfie and submit it with your, your social security <laughs> number and your, your driver's license. And, and voila, you can participate in some of these offerings now. That's right. We also have a fanny pack. So if you go to shop.tokensoft.io, you can order a credit investor fanny pack so you can hold your uh, driver's license passport and uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or sorry, it's your W two showing you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in annual uh, annual uh, salary or uh, one million dollars. And so the fanny pack is a perfect tool for keeping all that information together. Nice, uh, sounds like a must have. So, uh, so Mason, speaking seriously, um, you know, last time we talked was. Almost, uh, almost eighteen months ago. Um, how how is the um, how's the security token landscape changed? How how do you view the world of of infrastructure um, and compliance tools in that realm? And and are we getting closer to actually seeing anything uh, actually hit escape velocity when it comes to security tokens or regulated tokens that require transfer agents that require uh, you know, providers like TokenSoft to, to facilitate and, and kind of grease the wheels here? Yeah, so uh, one of the uh, biggest issues I think with security tokens is, is sort of, it's multifaceted. So one was uh, a lot of people were perceiving uh, the uh, security tokens uh, from sort of an ICO lens uh, and it's very different. It's actually the polar opposite of that. Um, it's better to approach it from a traditional lens. So with a lot of the tech that's out there, it's still tech that's designed for cryptocurrencies and not for security tokens. And so that's one like fundamental issue in the space. Um, the other is just lack of infrastructure. Uh, because everyone is coming up from it from that lens, uh, it made it harder for uh, harder to figure out like what's the right infrastructure that actually fits in the security token space. And that's just traditional infrastructure um, that's sort of mapping out into the blockchain. A lot of people bring up the, the question, you know, if you're doing that, you know, what are the benefits of actually putting this on the blockchain? And so uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, benefits that I'll talk about in a little bit, but those are the sort of major detractions to the space that slowed it down a lot. Um, I think, you know, since uh, we were uh, one of the first companies to uh, get set up with a broker dealer in the space, uh, then we got a transfer agent as well. Um, uh, to be able to service registered offerings. Um, and so as you can see, like if you're looking at it from a cryptocurrency lens, you just need a money transmitter license or you need a trust license. And now you can do everything. Everything's like vertically integrated. You're an exchange, you can do custody, um, you can do trading and you're doing compliance in the front. 
Um, but in the security space, the way the licenses work and uh, the, just due to the level of checks and balances, uh, to be able to do a full exchange, you need to partner with like three to five uh, different companies that have the different licenses to fit those different parts. So um, ATSs, for example, don't have custody. Uh, they're supposed to use a separate custodian to custody the assets. And that's just part of the checks and balances that, that come into play in the space uh, because um, uh, no one on Wall Street can trust each other. And that's why there's so much licensing in the security space. Um, so uh, one example is um, we've, uh, so we're doing a, uh, two of our customers, one is doing a, a IPO as an F1 offering. Uh, they're called INX. And so we've had to put up a bunch of infrastructure for that. And there's another registered offer offering we're doing as well um, as structured as an N2 offering. And that one's for a uh, regulated uh, treasury backed stable coin. And so um, you want to like set up this thing, but like you need all these like pieces to be able to play in this, in the sandbox of, of uh, public uh, regulated securities. And so, um, you know, how, who's going to do custody, uh, who's going to do uh, allow, allow for trading uh, like in a marketplace or for transfers in a marketplace um, and what are all the pieces that you need. And so one thing we rolled out for that is um, a big question was custody. A lot of people were trying to use MetaMask and shoehorn crypto into security. So we launched uh, token soft investment accounts. So now you can hold security tokens without holding ether. <laughs> um, and it's still completely user owned uh, where they have a majority of the keys. Um, and so I think the industry is getting there. The, the major blocker is still custody. Uh, there's still no SC or FINRA regulated uh, custodian in the space. And mm -hmm. I think once you have that, then the industry will flourish. The exchanges will get a little bit louder. Um, but uh, we're almost there. How long do you think that's, and when you say uh, there's no uh, regulated custodian, that's for all of crypto or are you uh, speaking specifically for um, securities. Uh, security tokens, right? Yeah, because uh, you've got like trust company structures, uh, you know, in Gemini and Paxos and, and a couple of others in, in, in New York. Yeah. Um, but that's it's, for uh, crypto assets and, and currencies, which would be more under the CFTC purview. Yeah. If you, if you look overseas, though, if you look at the partnership with Tokensoft International AG and uh, Seba Bank, uh, mm -hmm. they do have a full, in, in, in Switzerland, FINMA granted two licenses for full crypto licenses, or for full crypto activities, so custody, securities dealer uh, licensing. And so um, the licensing there is a little bit more robust than what you see in the U.S., where it's very fragmented. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one dynamic that we're noticing internationally is um, they're a little bit faster with the licensing than they are in the U.S. due to the fragmented nature. Um, you know, one thing that uh, is typical in crypto, it's, it's very atypical in the traditional realm, is uh, how liquidity is pooled across multiple exchanges. Um, and that, I think, presents you know, a ton of securities token challenges in terms of their interoperability across jurisdiction. Um, how do you, how have you thought about the challenges of connecting the, the pipes between Coinbase uh, or, or a security token exchange in the U.S.? I'm assuming that Coinbase uh, will, will have those capabilities when they become feasible and, and interesting um, versus a European exchange versus, a, you know, an Asian yeah. exchange. Any, any of the traditional um, platforms through which you'd, you'd actually want to trade crypto assets. Um, and you know, with with all of the restrictions that these specific tokens have, and um, and some of the liquidity issues that persist, because you're unlike Nasdaq or Nice, um, you know, the, the the shares of stock are are not all concentrated on one exchange. Yeah. The so I, I think from my perspective, the biggest value is the interconnectivity, um, and that's where we're going to realize the real efficiencies in terms of transfers and liquidity internationally. Um, so to answer your question, uh, in the U.S., it depends on the licensing. So to the extent the licensing there is there, uh, then we can definitely co connect. I think there's a few parties in the U.S. that are still um, operating in a very proprietary way. Um, and so that's sort of going to be a roadblock. And like everyone is going to have to open up if they do want to actually um, have these tokens trade on multiple venues and to move around and transfer in different technologies. Um, they will have to operate in a, in a less proprietary way. And uh, that's, that's one thing I hope becomes more normal. Um, 
And so once, once you have that, once you have that interconnectivity between the U.S. and different like uh, venues internationally, uh, now you have like a globally connected stock market. And I think that's like the cool like envision with security tokens is, is that connectivity. In terms of compliance, um, now you don't have to spend, uh, I don't know, like four weeks onboarding a fund or you don't have to uh, have a bunch of lawyers vetting a trade before it happens if it's in the private markets. Um, with things like ERC-1404, you can just do a check to see if these trades are authorized or not authorized. And if they're authorized, they just go through. Uh, the requisite paperwork is signed. Um, but the legal review is necessary to reinterpret, you know, what is the security and can it actually transfer between this person and the other. Um, so I think you'll probably see DeFi and security tokens merging a little bit in terms of the uh, end vision and end goal. Um, but I think like people just have to get over this regulatory hump to uh, to get there. Um, you you know you mentioned uh, programmatic stable coins, uh, so I want to come back to that and and don't think I didn't forget the we're in this this negative interest rate environment right now, and I think the question that um, that's on my mind, I'm sure it's on you know a lot of other people's minds, what's going to happen to all these uh, stable coin issuers who's you know, very business models are dependent on a positive rate environment. Um, and, and, you know, you obviously, I think, have some, some pretty strong opinions on this, but I am struggling to see a uh, future state in, you know, the near or medium term, which is really the only time that's relevant in, in you know, crypto terms, where um, the traditional or, or kind of early stablecoin model is feasible. And when you say early stablecoin model, are you referring to just like just the, the the one that we've seen so far, right? Where where the the float is, or the the assets under management are reinvested, and, and the issuer is able to um, sweep the interest to the you know either themselves or, or the other token holders. Yeah, I think I think what we're going to realize, like in five years, is there were a lot of like hacks to get this stuff up and running, and they don't necessarily like work in different environments. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, you know, the first thing when uh, the uh, the COVID stuff started happening for me was like, okay, well, what's going to happen to these stable coins that are uh, custody in traditional like trust accounts or uh, with money transmitters um, that are actually collateralized? And so, and naturally my, my mind went towards like bank runs. And so um, what happens if you hold, you're holding like USDC or Gemini dollar uh, not to bash on them, but from a uh, infrastructure perspective, what if there's a bank run? Like, are those the last out or are they the first out? And if you're trying to pull money out of like a crypto like exchange or, or, or bank, I think that's a, a lot harder um, than uh, pulling cash out. Um, we're doing it digitally through your bank. And so like if once you start to go through that, um, okay, so what's the alternative to that? That's the algorithmic stable coins. And, um, and so for those, like those actually have some resiliency because they're completely decoupled to the traditional banking uh, systems. And so whatever you think of the regulatory side of things, uh, that resiliency actually lives. So if you think about it, like it's closer to the decentralized ethos of Bitcoin um, and, and Ethereum. Um, and um, that's what naturally provides its re resiliency, like fundamentally. Um, and then what happens when uh, interest rates go negative? Um, so if you, so we did some like thinking and planning around this for negative interest environments at uh, TokenSoft. And so um, if you actually want to put negative interest rate currencies on the blockchain, you're going to have to either charge a large fee or pull money out of accounts. So just like mass burning um, uh, coins. Uh, so like, let's say there's 10 wallets, uh, they each have uh, $10 uh, and you would have to like mass burn like $1 out of each one of those to be able to pay for the uh, negative interest rates. And so you're going to have to have mechanisms like that. And uh, that's where like decentralized stable coins are kind of interesting because they have the resilience where no one can start to zap your money away, theoretically and ideally. <laughs> and, um, and so that's sort of been interesting in this environment is the decentralized tool, or the decentralized like currencies actually do live on. And, and the interest rates we've, we've been getting from like DeFi type stuff, like, is that going to last or does, <laughs> does that go negative as well? I think is a, is a good question. Um, the, I mean, I think the, if, if you think about like the real world, I think finance starts to break down in general when interest rates go negative. 
if that happens in DeFi, it's I I I have no idea how how DeFi persists in, in a negative rate environment. Um, I mean, we're going to find out soon enough. But um, do you think uh, you know one of one of the more promising um, projects in in the stablecoin space was Basis? Um, and Basecoin when 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 they launched and raised a ton of money from you know who's who of investors, um, and they had this programmatic central bank. That, so it was algorithmically generated and, and supposed to be you know kind of um, stabilizing around a peg through this seniorage shares model that they had. Um, if if some of the tools that have been built in the last eighteen months were around um, back in December of eighteen, I think it was when they shut down. Do you think it would be a different story? Uh, and do you think that a project like that could come to market with a very similar structure today, um, but using slightly different tools and, and you know, securities token framework maybe um, to facilitate the, um, the senior in shares? Or, or was that concept just dead in the water? And maybe you just explain a little bit the, um, the, the structure of these tokens. Yeah, so uh, my impression of basis when I first read the white paper without like knowing anything about what was going on um, with the fundraising or anything like that was it was a little bit too similar to traditional banking. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I don't see that. I, I never saw that as a value add. And so like, why would you basically take traditional systems and plug them into uh, smart contracts to try to create a decentralized like system? Um, and, and so like, it was a little bit of a, like, it, it didn't quite like make sense. Um, it was sort of like an oxymoron like project. Um, I think, uh, with, yeah, I, I think looking at it, like, again, um, it's, it's hard to see if it would actually be resilient in this environment or if it would actually mimic <laughs> the, the negative, like interest rates. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that's why like full, like you should either be like fully decoupled or fully like coupled, like security tokens like right now they have to be fully coupled and work backwards from traditional uh banking because they have to fit into the regulated environment and then we'll figure out what we can decentralize later um erc 1404 is actually um designed to be decentralized to the extent possible and so there's no compatibility issues anyone can go and use it there's a lot of projects out there that are just um innovating on it um, but with like stable coins, anything that's supposed to be fully decentralized, you probably want to stay as far on that extreme as possible. Bitcoin did that really well. ICOs did that worse. And so there were a lot of issues with that. Um, and so I think the closer you can stay on that, on that sort of uh, ideal uh, extreme of decentralization, the better. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people value like w how much thinking Satoshi did uh, in terms of making sure Bitcoin was as decentralized as possible. So number one, he was anonymous, so no one to go after. Um, number two, uh, the network is actually pretty, well, it's, it's, it was decentralized, like more decentralized at the beginning, but um, it's decentralized to the extent possible. Um, and all of those things that he did provide a lot of resiliency from like a regulatory perspective. Um, and so I think that's that's one issue I'm seeing is like some people are too far in the middle. They need to start on one extreme or the other before they can sort of uh, land in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess the the other uh, part of your business, which maybe is like an unspoken and and, and more you know bespoke uh, uh, type of services, is, is just thinking about how um, you can retroactively bring some projects back into the light or at least into the good races of, of uh, regulators if they deem that something is um, actually a security uh, ex post facto. And you know, many of these we kind of knew about in advance and, and it's just the, you know, the, the legal process uh, kind of running its course. But um, I think it's probably top of mind for a lot of people today. You look at a project like um, Telegram uh, and their Telegram open network, uh, which um, finally, uh, I think we've we've seen the last nail in the coffin uh, yeah. with news. We're, we're talking Tuesday, May, what is today? The 12th. Um, and, and just earlier today, um, the founder of Telegram uh, essentially said, yeah, uh, Pavel Zarov said, you know, we're, we're not going to actually be able to <laughs> go through this this project, not only in the U.S., but because the U.S. has such a, an outsized influence 
in the uh, global economy and, and financial services ecosystem, which was alarming because you know you knew that they were going to uh, basically forcibly return capital to the U.S. investors, but um, the fact that they scrapped the entire project is um, is crazy, right? So what what um, that's one extreme, but I would have thought that there would be opportunities for projects, maybe that um, that have already launched to uh, do some form of remediation, um, you know, kind of pay their slap on the wrist penalty, but um, but ultimately, you know, continue to operate and, and continue to, to propel their networks forward because they're already liquid and, and outstanding and in many cases globally traded. What, um, what role do you uh, play in, in that sort of process? And, and how do you think um, that kind of gray market or, 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 or that messy, uh, market is going to evolve as we start to see more rulings and, and you know, more resolutions one way or the other with some of these 2017, 2018 token projects. Yeah, so um, one, one thing I was uh, sort of surprised to learn over time was, um, so even traditional banks, you know, they screw up all the time. Uh, they screw up their KYC or they screw up um, how they're, you know, they're basically not not able to follow the rules all the time and part of the reason is they're just operating at such a scale that it's not possible to like mistakes are going to happen mm -hmm. and so uh, it's actually very common for banks to hire uh, different firms or to hire people in to help clean up um, so something got screwed up because of bad oversight and so they bring someone in uh, they clean up the procedures and the processes and Maybe they integrate some new technology. So what happened before with breaking the law doesn't happen again. Um, I think in uh, so same thing. Same thing happens in like crypto, um, uh, but for for different reasons, right? Um, these uh, the past I don't know the past ten years. These were all all startups um, that emerged to provide uh, infrastructure in the crypto space, the blockchain space, and um, some of them moved too quickly or didn't have the right experience or the right judgment. And so, um, you know, things, things get missed from the compliance regulatory side. So occasionally we'll get projects coming to us that need to, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, clean up or to uh, reprocess all of their users. And so we've, we've had a handful of these and uh, that's something that uh, we just got thrown into doing just because we're, we're good with the complex compliance uh, sort of situations uh, internationally, domestically. And so, um, uh, yeah, so if, if projects do sort of screw up on the compliance side, uh, we can, uh, you know, with our counsel and with the right uh, guidance, evaluate that to see if we can uh, help clean it, up from a, clean it up from a regulatory perspective. Um, I think with things like Telegram, um, I think they were, uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen there. I have a hunch that uh, they are going to launch, they're going to have another entity launch the blockchain. I think I saw uh, something in the news about that. So what happens when Telegram can't launch the blockchain? Well, it doesn't stop other people from launching the blockchain, uh, the same blockchain. And so uh, it's going to be interesting to see if that's what their strategy is here, whether it's sort of a pump fake where they're saying, okay, we're out, but then someone else is going to come out with a, with a blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like uh, Elon Musk with Tesla. Hey guys, I'm leaving California. I can't take it anymore. And then the next thing, the next thing we know is he's sending everyone back to work. Um, and so uh, sometimes I, I guess you'll see stuff like that on the market, but it'll be interesting to see if Telegram actually ends up launching. Uh, if you uh, you know kind of look into your crystal ball, we we talked about um, you know custody being one of the missing pieces. Um, just Generally speaking, you know, liquidity is hard to come by in, in some of these uh, nascent markets. And, and for security tokens, uh, I think you're probably looking at the, um, at the markets where some liquidity is better than none. And you're, you're probably talking about a, a target investor base that doesn't care quite as much about slippage on day one um, as they might in, in you know, other you know, traditional assets where there are healthy regulated exchanges. Um, over the course of the next couple of years, I mean, do you have do you have a sense for what type of volume and what type of mix we're going to see on these exchanges? Do, you know, do you think that we'll see um, SAFs or kind of private uh, some of these privately traded uh, assets uh, start you know getting liquidity on these security token exchanges just in case if they're still treated as securities? Is it going to be stable coins? Is it going to be you know 
real estate. I mean, there's, uh, there's been a lot of talk. There's been very, very few actual assets uh, that have been, that have been you know, traded and, and tokenized so far and, and had any liquidity to speak of. Yep. So um, I think, yeah, if, if you're talking SAFTs, I think, you know, there, there are secondary markets for SAFTs. Uh, I won't say where or who. Uh, but uh, the problem with SAFs and putting that into a regulated environment is it's so gray market that um, it's hard to justify doing that. Um, so if you look at a traditional, um, you know, a traditional equity round and uh, are looking to plug that equity into a regulated institution, that's very easy. That happens all the time with uh, shares post. Uh, and we just saw an announcement with shares post and forge today uh, as well. And so um, on, if you look at the real estate side, it's a little bit different because average transaction sizes are a lot higher. Um, and so I think one thing that's going to be really interesting is uh, sort of you're probably going to see the polar opposite of what you see in like crypto markets that are bootstrapping, um, where they try to uh, uh, pull in a lot of liquidity through market makers. Uh, they try to you know pump the price. It starts at a very low price and you can buy small amounts. Um, and I think in the real estate and the private placement market, what we're seeing is much larger check sizes, uh, 25K, 50K, 100K, um, and we're seeing transfers of that value happening. So I think if the right product uh, gets to market, and uh, we're gonna announce something along these lines uh, soon, um, that it can scale. And, and so if the right product does get to market, it probably can scale at those transaction vol uh, values and that volume. Um, and do really well. And I think it's just a matter of execution. Um, I think it's been uh, really hard for the industry because they started from like ICO back when you're supposed to do the opposite. So we always started from regulations back. What happens traditionally? How do we work backwards from that? Um, and so uh, there's a lot of impediments to that. Um, and so I think we'll see the polar opposite. So I think, I think the volume that you see will probably scale really quickly. Um, there might be, there might be a cap at the end of the day. Um, I think if you can merge traditional crypto with the traditional finance space, I do think that that's where you can actually start to see a much larger increase in terms of, of volumes, but that's maybe three years out before that happens. Um, but in the short term, I think by the end of the year, you will see decent volumes, um, that are, that are trading and transferring between counterparties. Well, when you say decent volumes, just give me a ballpark. I'd have to, I'd have to do some math. Um, or, 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 or try to put it in context, um, you know, with the crypto markets or, or the I traditional think, think, uh, you know, equity markets. I think by the end of the year, I would like to see in security tokens, at least like $10 million in volume, like exchanging hands, like on the super conservative side, because if the space can prove that out, that will prove that like this can scale much larger because how many funds and asset managers are actually out there, out there how much real estate, now with this market is trying to exchange hands and that's a lot more than like six months ago or a year ago. Um, and so I think that would be a great conservative target for, for the space. And then if anything better happens than that, then, then amazing. At least we have the core infrastructure to help it scale if we can hit that target. And, and I mean, to give people a, a sense for 10 million, um, that's, it sounds low in Bitcoin terms, but if you're thinking about the, the long tail of assets on crypto exchanges, uh, last 24 hours in, in, in a real 10 volume, this is, you know, Zcash, Dash, Paxos token, USDC are, are all around that threshold. So it, it, it certainly seems feasible. Um, and, you know, you, I mean, you got to get to 10 million before you get to 100 million. The, by the way, the status quo, <laughs> the status quo right now is like, 200, 600 a day, like dollars <laughs> in security tokens. And so well, what's even, what's even trading like B cap. Like I, I don't even, I don't, I can't name a single security token right now. Yep. What is there's, trading? There's the stuff on open finance and there's the stuff on T zero and on T zero. Um, I believe it's either overstock token or overstock dividend token, something like that. Um, and then B cap on open finance, but there's like four or five that are actually really trading, but and the volumes aren't anything. So, if we can hit 10 million, that's a huge, I would say that's a huge milestone. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a huge number in the general like crypto space, but it'll actually has, show. Has, has, has anyone created a uh, 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 like security token 
uh, listing page because this sounds like something that we should do. But I just I haven't I haven't seen anything, and to my knowledge, I didn't even really think aside from BCAP anything was 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 trading. Um, I guess you know T zero you know has their own dividend token trading on their own exchange, but um, I'd uh, I'd be curious to see the list because we could spin that up pretty easily. If you do it, we would uh, we would integrate it. There's uh, there's some uh, data feeds that we have as well um, that we could probably partner on. Um, we'll talk about that offline. Um, <laughs> but um, so uh, uh, yeah, I I think there's a, a broader question right now about just accreditation rules in general, and um, and you know whether those are. Uh, woefully outdated, which they are, um, and and kind of what the path forward is for making other types of of investing activity, non traditional investing activity, certainly in the last you know 40, 50, 60 years, more accessible to uh, end you know retail audiences. Um, so how how do you think about the evolution? You know, we, we've heard that they're working on uh, adjustments to Reg CF and Reg A plus, where they kind of raise the threshold that you can. Um, uh, you can, you know, issue each year and, and, and the amount of capital you can raise from um, different yeah. groups under these exemptions. Uh, or do, how do those fit under um, the token soft, you know, suite of products? And, and are, are you focused on that or are you focused on the bona fide securities that are not reliant necessarily in some of these exemptions? Um, so everything that we do plugs into exemptions into the U.S. or like I said, there's those two registered offerings. So mm -hmm. once those get through, there's no accreditation necessary to purchase, right? So one way is to just go full IPO. Uh, Reg A, definitely a harder time getting through the door. We've only seen two get through there. Um, and uh, Reg CF, uh, lots of so prop, props, props and block stack being the only two, yeah. right? Yep. Um, what did you What did you take uh, away from the Algorand props announcement? Uh, the The takeaway from uh, the public from 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 from, pro from, from props uh, switching over to use the Algorand blockchain, and whether it had anything to do with the fact that they shared investors or uh, or Algorand was an investor. Um, what 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 types of issues does that create? If any, uh, when you're talking about issuing securities tokens or, or you know, Reggae Plus tokens, I, I, yeah, I can't exactly comment on that on that one. Very Too unfortunately. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sure I can I can tell from your facial expression that you'd really like to. <laughs> I, yeah, I, always. Yeah, I'd love to answer every question you have. <laughs> um, we will uh, we'll, we'll pass on that. We'll take that as a hard no comment. <laughs> so there's, yeah, so there's Reg A, there's uh, Reg D, which requires accredited investors. Um, there's other thresholds which are higher. And so you can close your sale off to just have qualified institutional buyers or qualified purchasers, whatever. And so they have to have 5 million uh, and up in assets. Um, I'm, I'm okay with those rules. Like I'm okay that these sales are limited. Um, and I don't think like making the accreditation requirements lower is necessarily a good thing. I think bumping Reg CF up to 5 million is a great idea. Um, I think, you know, that's definitely something that a lot of like one, 1 million, uh, you can't really do much with at the end of the day. So like Reg CF for 1 million, just based on the amount of effort and now you have to manage the investors. And so it's a big challenge. So if you want to do it, it's probably great from a marketing standpoint, but if you actually want to raise capital to do something and, and scale a business, the 5 million threshold is a lot more interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But then, uh, you know, our platform also supports jurisdictions internationally. The most we've done is over 50. And so um, from that perspective, like with international markets, um, from a U.S. perspective, raising money internationally, um, uh, the barrier is you have to meet those local requirements. So once you can do that, um, then uh, that sort of taps into a, a much more interesting market as well. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of different avenues. Um, I'm okay with the current accreditation requirements. At the end of the day, if you don't have the assets to be an accredited investor, you can buy the hat at shop.tokensoft.io and you can at least look like a accredited investor. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so what, uh, what haven't we talked about that, uh, that's on your mind in, uh, in the landscape more generally or in life more generally? Uh, 
Um, we can talk about work from home stuff, unless uh, that's already played out enough. I feel like that's played out, but I, I um, but I, I am interested to sample uh, folks, you know, kind of throughout the industry, especially folks that are are in a major city right now, right? So you have these token teams. Many of them are the workforce is distributed, even if the, the yeah. protocol itself and, and project isn't. Um, that's typically been less true for infrastructure companies, right? Um, you know, you guys are in San Francisco, we're in New York. Um, yeah. You know, most of the exchanges are in a major city, right? And, yeah. and once they get to a certain, you know, size, maybe less satellite offices. But um, this has really blown that up, right? Like we're, um, we're spending, you know, now months and months and months. And in some cases, we've got employees that will pretty soon um, be used to remote work and have spent more time remote with us than yeah. physically with us, right? Yeah. Um, it's tough to envision a scenario where, A, things go back to normal, especially in New York, um, in, uh, in the you know, next couple of months. And, and B, most, most of us have kind of gotten used to this. Like we've invested in the workflows. Like we've got a lot of this. Um, we've done a lot of the like brain damage to actually get comfortable uh, or, or make do with remote work. And it's, <laughs> it's like extremely difficult for me to envision a, a scenario where, uh, a couple months from now, like I'm just, you know, on the, on the New Jersey transit, you know, coming into the city every day with all of the other commuters, all of us wearing masks, um, into the same, like, you know, Petri dish of a WeWork, which was already shit to begin with. Um, like I, I, I just feel like there's like, who, who's going to actually put up with that right now? Um, it, uh, it doesn't feel, uh, like that you know, is, is, is going to be compelling for, for anyone in, in the U.S. especially because, uh, you know, we're probably going to get the worst of it here. Um, and I wonder uh, what that ultimately means, not so much for just like future of work, but if that's ultimately going to help more crypto teams move international anyway, right? Or, or at least kind of expand their, their operations so that they have these different redundancies. So the, the, the companies that are not yet international, if, if this helps them do that. Um, yep. or this helps them branch in, into different states. Yeah, Legitimately, not just putting like a PO box and, you know, in, in Hoboken versus New York City, like some, like some do. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think um, those of us that do, uh, you know, like to have the whole team together, I think we're just generally like more conservative. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why we go in that direction. If, if you're like crypto first, um, like if we were just running a blockchain project, everything was on GitHub and we we're just tracking everything online. Um, and there's no like business team or sales force needed. That's a very different dynamic. And so, um, I think what this has proven to me at least is, um, you can still run, uh, you know, a business team and a sales force and still have that legitimacy even without an office. What made us actually get a, uh, nice, clean looking, uh, organized office, uh, in a tall building in San Francisco was, um, at some point, uh, these investment banks started like coming to meet with us and, uh, they had, you know, suits and cufflinks and all that stuff. And I was like, okay, this is never going to work <laughs> if we're in a co working space, we're going to need like our own office with like security and like all that stuff, uh, with a conference room, a dedicated conference room and, and all those things. And so, that's sort of what forced the change was just like having that like quality facade. Um, and you see, you look at the trade-offs. And so um, I think the stuff that happened with us is just efficiency went up. Um, and so we ran the numbers and depending on how you look at them, our uh, engineering throughput went up like three X uh, mm -hmm. since COVID <laughs> and, um, and communication is better. Everything being online first just forces um, very lucid thinking, very clear organization, very good communication. Uh, we hop on the phone where, whenever we need to. Um, sales hasn't gone down, it's gone up. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that like perception of, I, I think it's like hyper-focusing everything on actually like quality and delivery. And I'm hoping that like perception of like needing to have a normal office and having to like uh, shake hands with people, like that's still important, I think, but hopefully this downplayed a little bit and we can operate in a more decentralized way uh, and we can sort of um, execute like this. Cause I'm, I'm super efficient like this. Um, you know, I, I don't have to 
there's no like random conversations that happen. I can just focus on my work and then actually get things done. I, I also just have to wonder how much of a deflationary impact that's going to have on the economy, right? Like even in a perfect scenario where there was like a perfect V-shaped recovery, you're still going to have a massive dislocation in spending on both the business and the personal side because of this de-urbanization, de, you know, uh, basically lowering the need to commute, lowering the need to congregate, you know, five days a week in an office, um, and to do so in some of the most expensive locales in the world, right? No, no less. So it's, it's, yeah, I mean, um, you'll hear this with, uh, with lawyers, right? Like, you know, move out of your fucking, you know, ivory tower. I don't want to wait in the expensive waiting room. I would rather you reduce your billable rate by 300 an hour. Yeah. And you know what? You can probably do that if you move out of this real estate and you can even pocket yeah. a little bit extra, you know, to, 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 to boot. So um, I think that's very real. And, you know, that sounds good in micro, but in macro, um, it's, it's tough to, to even contemplate how, how much of a deflationary and, and, and negative impact that could have. I think, uh, I think just it, globally. Yeah. I, th I think it depends on like how fast uh, the economy can adapt because everything is going like some industries were still analog first, uh, like supermarkets, restaurants, bars. Um, and so now they're forced to be internet first. Mm -hmm. And what do you have when you go internet first, you have better distribution. Um, you can now access more people uh, maybe you start locally, but you can, you know, branch out to the next counties over and over. Um, and so I think if the economy can adapt in these analog first markets, I think mm -hmm. it can do really well. Like uh, Tesla, even though they're sending people back to the factory, they're still like digital first. Like there's a lot of robotics built into their like assembly lines and they can put them up really quickly as a result. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping it like provides that kind of a shift. So companies become leaner, they become more efficient, they get better distribution. Um, and uh, that's basically how like Amazon got so big. And so hopefully that like actually spreads and becomes more of the ethos of, of corporations out there. And if, if that does happen, if we do get better distribution, it could be that um, the, uh, the, uh, the GDP actually is able to stay, well, maybe I'm not going to get that excited, but it could be that the economy actually stabilizes after a while and uh, is able to adapt. So I think it could be a good thing. It's going to toughen up a lot of the, the companies out there. Agreed. Uh, well, uh, well, I, I know and have a lot of faith uh, in, in you as an operator, and it sounds like there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the realm of securities tokens. Uh, where can people find you and learn more about the company, Mason? Uh, you can go to tokensoft.io um, to learn more about our, our services and what we do. Mm -hmm. um, you can um, uh, also follow us on Twitter uh, at Tokensoft Inc. Um, I got called out last time internally because I plugged my personal Twitter, not my company Twitter. So it's Tokensoft at Tokensoft Inc. What's the and, personal one? And then my personal one is uh, Masonic underscore tweets. Uh, that's Masonic nice. underscore tweets. So you can follow us on Twitter, go to our website, and uh, we'd love to chat with you. It's it's interesting that you say that because I um uh I I had the same mindset early on with Masari as well, and then uh, at some point we we started recognizing two things. One, why the fuck wouldn't we try to start from the bigger base? Uh, and number two, most brands are like personal anyway. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, it's one thing if you have, you know, folks on your team that are basically like spending all their time tweeting and just like trying to, you know, boost their own brand, but it's not signed back to the company. But um, you and me can't go anywhere. We're, we're, we're locked in, man. Like there, there's, there is no flight risk with those accounts, right? Uh, the the, the two-bit idiot is going to live and die by Masari. <laughs> um, and so we can, we can, you know, show as much stuff as, as we want from my account. And, and I certainly do. And, and I've invested in it because, you know, talk about, you know, uh, in some cases, an order of magnitude, more impressions and, 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 you know, whatnot. So you should chill away, um, and, and encourage everyone else in your team not to. And, and if, uh, if you want to use that excuse, you can tell them, uh, that, uh, what, what I told you, you're not going anywhere. You can't by definition. Um, we're, we're slaves to our own creations. That's right. Um, 
the uh, so check uh, check out Mason and Tokensoft. Uh, Mason, it's always a pleasure. We're gonna we're gonna sidebar as soon as we turn the camera off and try to figure out how to give people better information in real time to the securities token market. Uh, it doesn't really matter right now, but by the end of the year, you heard it here first. It will. Ten million in daily volume is the target, which is still peanuts, <laughs> but it's something. It's something more than six hundred dollars a day. Mason, stay well, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. And for everyone else that's tuned in, listening, watching, whatever your preferred medium is, we will be right back here in just a couple of days with other unqualified opinions. Until then, be good, stay safe. Peace.